uh, tired of that level of pretense that so often we feel we have to carry around. And sometimes it's well motivated because we're, we, we, we want to set a good example. There's this dear lady in our, in our church. She's, uh, she's soon to hit 90. She got converted in the late 60s, came to faith after some difficult circumstances she went through. And she's, she's, she's of the, uh, uh, the war generation. So she's just like, nothing will stop me. You know, I, I remember hearing tales of how uh, all the healthcare professionals, uh, when COVID first came out, was, was sort of saying, no, you've got to, listen, Vi, you've got to stay in your house. You've got to stay in it. You've got to look after yourself. She's like, I'm going out. <laughs> she's like, if there's a challenge, she's not going to be bowed by it. But then sometimes you listen to, listen to Vi, and in those quieter moments, she'll ask a really sensitive question about herself and the Lord or something that she's facing and then when she prays, she reveals a tender and gentle heart. You see, there's, you, can, you can aim to do really well, yet at the same time be honest enough to say that there are things that, that we face that are just too much for us. You know, sometimes we feel the pressure to pretend that we're always in control, even though in that moment you're utterly out of control. <laughs> I remember turning up uh, not so long ago at the house of one of the, the young mums in our church, and um, <laughs> it, was a, it was just brilliant. It was, it was like a picture of modern life. She opened the door, saw it was the pastor, and looked totally shocked because in one arm was a baby, under her left ear was a phone, under her left arm was a bottle of wine. <laughs> and it, I was just like, that is just, that's life, isn't it? It's life. You know, sometimes we have to pretend that we've sort of got all the answers. Maybe you feel like you've got to do that when you're... Your kids ask you a, diff- a difficult question or somebody, somebody's struggling and you want to be able to be there for them in that moment. Sometimes you've just got to pretend that we're strong when really we're just about clinging on. Can I tell you the safest place to be in those moments when you drop your pretense is in the presence of Jesus? Because though we're not in control, though we're not strong and though we certainly haven't got all the answers, guess who has? He has. The Lord Jesus We want to be near him. And one of the reasons I just love the Gospels is that as the Lord Jesus comes in to reclaim a world that has walked away from him, um, have you noticed that wherever he is, the kingdom breaks out? You get a glimpse of, uh, of a restored world. If you like, the curse is reversed when you're near Jesus. So often I I speak with people and and I say, well, what can I pray for you? And they say something along the lines of this, and you know what they're going to say, because we all, we all, pray, uh, all say this at one point or another. Maybe they're not coping, maybe they're facing an overwhelming situation, and they say something along the lines of this when I say, what can I pray for you? And they say, inner strength. Have you ever, you ever asked somebody to pray that for you? Where on earth do we get that idea that somehow if we screw ourselves up, up enough inside that we'll play like a, a Disney princess and pull this sort of inner strength magical amulet out of ourselves and we'll be able to conquer and overcome? So when people ask me to pray that, I say, do you know what? I know what you're talking about, but I ain't going to pray that for you. I'm going to pray you would be very, very aware that you can be near the strong one. Strength comes from being by the strong one that's what my daughters do when they're down in town when it's late and it's dark and there's rowdiness around they move closer to their mother (laughs) (laughs) when we feel weak or under threat you move closer to (laughs) Paul's looking like what kind of wuss are you okay yeah that's it don't worry I hide behind my wife and a diet coke all the time but listen the section of scripture we're looking at right now is There is no pretense in these moments. This is our address and where we live. We are in Mark chapter 5 in the domain of disease and the domain of death. And of course, it's exactly where you guys live. How do I know this? Put up your hand if you've taken medication in the last 24 hours. Yep, put your hands down. Do you get it? I won't ask you to put up your hand if you've attended the funeral of a loved one or a close one within the last... 24, uh, 12 months, 24 months, because I already know that you have. These things happen. Disease and death are those great things that laugh at us and expose our weakness and defy our pretense at having all the answers. The Bible tells us that we will live, as we know, in a world where death seems to reign. It robs us of family. It rob- robs us of friends. It so often robs us of dignity. It laughs at us. 
And we live in a world where the worst nightmare can can come true. The parents of a 12-year-old are suddenly worried whether she will make it to her 13th birthday. You see, in our world, health is almost not normal. You should be surprised on those days when you do jump up out of bed without falling over and, and, and feel absolutely chipper because we live under a curse. Now, I realize on a Saturday morning when it's almost looking as if it's fighting off the rain, it's like, Steve, this is a bit of a downer. And you'd be right. But is Jesus big enough to be able to refocus us when we have to face and not pretend about the worst realities in life? We live in a world where there's chronic illness where, and, and injuries that can come along and claim every element of our life we suddenly have to reorder everything and our hopes and dreams get pushed down the the path or pushed aside completely and we're like where did this come from i didn't put this in my script but it's there and the bible says it hasn't always been that way and one day a day is coming hallelujah when these things that assail and attack us won't be there anymore but the question is how are we going to get through to that And how are we going to keep going whilst we're waiting for that day? And it's the reason why I'm so glad we're in the gospel. Because I don't have to pretend anymore. We as a community of believers, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be the first to drop the pretense. Not because we don't want to try to do the right thing, but because we want to view our lives and our problems and that of the community around us through the lens of a risen saviour who is present with us. And that's why this story that we're going to look in in Mark chapter 5 is one of my favourites in the Bible. The people, both of the, the two main characters alongside Jesus, which is this woman and this dad, they're two of my biggest heroes in the Bible. I, I, I never get tired of going to this story. And I, what are we going to see? We're going to read it in a minute, but what, what I want to warn you ahead of time is that If you are somebody who has ever run into a problem that you cannot fix, particularly in the domain of the curse breaking loose against you, death and disease, you might just in those moments have to say to yourself, perhaps this is not a job for me. Perhaps this is a job for Jesus. Which is the thing that unites both the lady and the dad They're at the end of themselves and they will come to him. And he's not thrown off his stride by this. In fact, the reason that Mark puts this story in here is because he wants to see what faith looks like. Faith looks like living with a sense of your neediness enough, not being needy in high maintenance, but with a sense of your neediness enough that your first instinct is to go to Jesus. Is that the kind of church you want to be? The first instinct. When I'm kicking off in the morning because I feel like my world's coming to an end because one of the kids has spilt the cereal. When I'm worried that the fact that, well, my my size 12s don't fit me anymore and I'm moving more in the direction of a size 16. When at work somebody's saying, hold on, the bottom line is being affected greatly here and we don't know quite about uh, job security anymore. In those moments, the first place we go is we say, Who is Jesus and how is he going to impact this situation if I let him in? So I want to dare you to believe, I want you to dare you to imagine what you sort of know theologically is true, but so often is so difficult to connect with, that Jesus is a present Lord for you and me now to the glory of his name. Oh, could you imagine what we'd look like as a community of believers if we'd really bet our life on that day by day? People wouldn't know who they'd bumped into. Because they'd be bumping into people who are walking with Jesus. So let's have a little look at this story. And I I don't mind telling you, it's harrowing. I think it's harrowing. So let's go to it. I think we've probably got it popping up on here. It's in Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through to 43. Uh, Let's have a think. Uh, How are we doing on time? Do you know what? We'll just start, we'll start working through it. We'll read through it bit by bit rather than go all the way through it. But you'll better pick it up pretty quickly. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, 
he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, you you guys know what a prayer like this looks like, my little daughter is at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. He's very clear what he wants brought into his life, which he feels is slipping away from his life. Keep going. And he went with him. That was a fast answer to prayer, wasn't it? And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a, dis- uh, had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now we're going to stop there for a second. If you follow in your notes, you'll notice that I've put this put this down as a concept of sort of being desperate, drained, under a curse, beyond human help. Let's have a look at these two people. Jairus. Jairus. Who was he? He was a guy who, in the synagogue, it was his responsibility to take care of business and get stuff fixed. He spent his life fixing stuff. He was like a deacon in that church situation. Uh, it's a little bit like um, I, I bumped into Reg. You always know somebody who can fix them. Where's Reg gone? He's in here somewhere. You need to look at Reg's key ring. It's got a tape measure. It's got a radiator key. It's got everything. There was a guy who knew how to fix anything. He was your go-to guy. Sorry, I've, yeah, I hope you're not on Instagram because people will be chasing you down now. Okay, Reg? <laughs> That's it. But he's where no parent would ever want to be. Who knows quite how it started. It started with, start with a cough or a sniffle. And one morning, the little one wasn't looking too well. And Dad said, it'll be fine. But then the next day, the symptoms turn worse. We don't know how long this has been going on for, but we're at the point of utter desperation. That's where Dad is right now. And in those moments of desperation, you become aware of things and you start to see things uh, differently. I remember um, uh, last year, sadly, middle of last year, my younger brother died from terminal cancer. And there were two terrible pains in the midst of that. Not only was the loss of my brother but there was watching what it did to my father. He's he's got an engineering background. He's a fix-it kind of guy. I don't know how many hours he spent on Google trying to come up with a solution. And the thing that cut him was not just the prospect of losing his son. And he'd say to me, and he'd use my full name because my parents do, he'd say, Stephen, it's not supposed to be this way. And there is nothing I can do about it. It brings you to that point of desperation. And here she is, she's 12 years old, and there is nothing that the dad can do. Now, he's a man of standing, he's well-connected, but his dignity gives way to desperation. Do you notice what he did? He did what men in that age wouldn't have done. He runs up to Jesus, and he just casts himself at Jesus' feet. But he's not the only one in this story. You've also got this lady, this woman. Now... (laughs) In some of your Bibles, oh, this makes me cross. In some of your Bibles, they put a heading, and it says, the woman with the issue of bleeding. How would you like to be known as the woman with the issue? And I say that with a bit of um, amusement, but the reality is, is that quite often we feel like that, don't we? So often we feel as if our issues have become our identity. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, that's partly because the, the world can be a cruel place and we can f- so often feel um, judged, looked upon outside by things that have happened to us, choices that we've made, the way that we look, how much we earn, our size and our shape, our relational history... And the world can be cruel, but shall I tell you what's even more cruel than the world? It's the self-talk that we get going that goes with it. And we sort of sit in these quiet lives of desperation, wondering whether we measure up, whether we're quite enough. And there are certain circumstances and situations that, that we face that have an ability to just crush us, just like that. And here she was, she was, she was, she was in there tells us that she had uh, 
12 years suffered from some sort of gynecological, it's easy for you to say, gynecological issue that had dominated her life. It was a particularly cruel one in that first century because it wasn't just incredibly painful. It didn't just rob her of a measure of dignity. It was isolating. It meant that she had to be cut off from the spiritual life of the church in view of some of the Levitical laws and the way that the, tra- tra- uh, the Jewish traditional culture worked. It meant, get this, that when she went into a room, she wasn't able to announce her name, smile and shake somebody by the hand. As she moved into the room, she simply had to say, unclean. In other words, her issue walked six feet in front of her wherever she went. And you know the way people are. They would have looked and they'd have said, you're less than me. They'd have looked and said, she probably did something to deserve that. And what would have that have done in her heart? That would have gone in through her ears and been magnified in the echo chamber of her own fears. Do you know what that means? Have you been there over something? course you have and it tells us here and it alludes to this that that she was utterly drained 12 years I can put up with some sort of trials for a month I've got enough adrenaline enough type a personality I could maybe go three months six months 12 months but 12 years cut off from the option of of intimacy and closeness with another no touch husband forget it isolated and away And we meet her at a point where she is utterly drained and utterly isolated. Now we look at these two people and we see, hold on, they're incredibly different. You're right. He's a guy of standing. She has absolutely no standing. He's a synagogue ruler. She isn't even allowed into the synagogue. He's got a name. She has no name. He's respected. She's rejected but they're brought together by one thing what is it their sense of need can i tell you where faith starts faith starts with a painful awareness of your need faith is birthed with a sense of need faith says this is my only hope the problem is we live in a world that tells us you can find it within yourself to overcome you can be a victor you can be strong go on trust yourself Uh, I found this this quote not so long ago from an author a Christian book it's called get out of uh, get out of your head It's her argument. And she noticed this. It's impossible to navigate through our culture without being bombarded with messages about how we can do better and be better. Experts speak directly to our desires for hope through self-improvement books, websites, etc. We feel a surge of optimism and the thrill of anticipation rises within us when we hear how the right mantra, the right workout, the right financial plan, the right determination will lead us to the better, more fulfilling life we sense should be ours. Who doesn't like a nip and tuck, a plan and a resolution to declare and push and grow? Who doesn't like the idea that with a little more determination, we can be better than before? None of us wants to stay stuck. And as you listen to that, were your hearts drawn towards it? They were. Except for a few of you who've had so much life experience and have got up and then failed again and got up and then failed again that you've headed in the the direction of despair. In fact, you could argue that every human being on the planet to some degree is somewhere on the spectrum of being a manic depressive. Manic mean one day, I can overcome this. You know, that's what that influencer on YouTube says. I can do it. And and then you know what's coming. Yeah, yeah, what's the point why even bother I tell you in the presence of Jesus 
when disease and death and all those things that laugh at our inability to overcome some things and almost mock our best resolutions that the strength will come from within me. When we are there going through that, Jesus is whispering. And they both come. And my second point here is that they come with a faith that comes through a touch from Jesus. There is something else very similar and the same about these guys. They both end up at the same place. Where was that? Where though? On the ground. (laughs) At the feet of Jesus. All people one day will bow before him. These guys, just because of their situation, have been pushed to the point where they've, (laughs) they've got no choice. Maybe that's you. The storm bowed to Jesus. The demons in the previous story that we couldn't look at bowed to Jesus. Death and disease bowed to him. The big question is, will we? And wow, what a one to come and bow before who is so gracious. So we have this strange situation going on there. Let's go back to the text. Just uh, Can we flick back a few verses? Here we go. Go back and keep going. Oh, stop. Then came one of the rules. Uh, go down again. One. <laughs> My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And can you imagine the euphoria he experiences in the next verse when this comes along? And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. There's this level of excitement. Maybe Jesus is going to break in and do something amazing. But that doesn't happen first because we get the attention going to this woman. This woman. And she comes. Why does she come? Well, because of her neediness. Does she understand who Jesus is fully? No. There's an element of superstition to it in her coming. She's also defined in her mind very clearly what she wants Jesus for. What is it? Healing. What kind of healing? Physical. The number of times when people come and speak to me as a pastor, and uh, uh, they're angling for something from Jesus, and in that moment... All they can see is the thing that has dominated their life situation. And what I love about the Lord Jesus is he doesn't kick people away just for their, the thing that they can see that they want from him. But is that all that he, he wants to give them? No, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. So here she is, and she is petrified. She's like, almost like SAS Special Forces sneaking through a hostile crowd she's probably got her face covered i love this woman because on that morning she got up and she basically said i can either roll over and die or i can dare to hope again and go to jesus now have you any idea how hard this would have been for her because we're told in this story that she's already been uh, spent shed loads of dough on quacks And all they've done is empty her of hope and empty her bank account. Have you noticed that that quite often the things that we try to use or leverage to to fix some of the things around us, they promise so much but deliver so little? And many of us have been made fools of by our best strategies to try and overcome the problems that are beyond us. So I'm amazed and she gets up and she goes. And she goes and she says, I can either roll over and die or I can get up and go to Jesus. And she's there in the midst of the crowd with a sense of her neediness. And in many ways, she's a rebuke to the rest of the crowd. Because the rest of the crowd are just around Jesus. But she's pursuing to touch and grab a hold of Jesus. Now, this is a rebuke to anybody who has Jesus around them. And thinks that it's a normal day. It's not. But in that moment, they didn't feel their neediness. Therefore, they didn't rush 
to be able to see the enormity of who he is. But she on this day was daring to believe. And I love this, the self-talk in verse 28. Have a look at this. We get inside her mind. We see what she's thinking. Bump down to verse 28 for us, would you? For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. So she sees something about his enormous... But that wouldn't be great if you can just oh, I'll grab a hold of Paul's really weird hoodie that talks about crabs on the back. <laughs> <laughs> what a crabbing... Cr- I, forget it. <laughs> and suddenly I'll feel chipper. <laughs> so she had some sort of faith and expectancy of, of, of what it would look like to meet Jesus. But she's desperately pushing through the crowd and she reaches out and she touches in faith can i tell you that christ is available his mercy is available to everybody but who tends to get it those who reach out for it you've got to grab for it and so something amazing is about to happen and so she grabs for it and i want you to see these verses that are here because that they leave me utterly staggered where's the next verse i will be made well And this is what it says. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And notice this phrase here. She felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? I I don't know what that must have felt like. Warm. But it, you notice the word immediately. No six month therapy plan. No appointment after appointment after appointment with the NHS. Immediately, in that second, her physicality was restored to healthy. Now, there's a few of you who are puffing and blowing trying to walk up the stairs out there. Would you like some of that? There are some of you who are popping more pills than my wife drinks Diet Cokes, which is a considerable amount. Would you like some of that? Can I tell you that is yours? A day is coming, oh this is wonderful, a day is coming when our broken bodies of this world will give way to our renewed bodies of the glory lands. That is going to be a physical experience of everybody who is held fast by Jesus. You will be able to breathe again. You will be able to see without those things on your face again. You will feel alive. You will, well, she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now, this is the great thing about being a Christian. When you meet Jesus, some things are fixed immediately, the most important things. Some things are in the process of being fixed, but all things will be fixed ultimately. When we meet Jesus... We are ransomed, healed, restored and forgiven, given a place at the table and a few other things that this lady is about to get that she didn't even bargain for. Through our life, we are being renewed and restored into the image of the one who made us and loved us. But a day is coming when we will be fully, soul and body, restored. And of course, we do pray for healing. And pray for healing, you should. And don't we just love stories of listened to somebody the other day who was, was given a, a, a six months expected lifespan uh, with the cancer three and a half years later she's still going strong and her oncologist is going well these numbers just don't work out <laughs> we're like we pray for healing but sometimes he wants to show the world his power by keeping you through the suffering because he knows that that great day is coming for all of us And at this point, he could have moved on. Let's have a look. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched me? And the disciples laughed at his face. What do you mean, who touched you? People are everywhere. But if you notice how this lady, she wanted a healing, but Jesus wants to turn this into an encounter. She wanted a physical healing, but was there more to be done in her life in that moment? What about all that other junk about who she see, saw herself as, as how she considered herself an outsider? She never felt like she got a place. 
The Lord Jesus could have walked on and she would have settled for less. But he is going to force the issue and it is painful. She's terrified. Let's read on. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? Next one. And he looked around to see who had done it. The piercing eyes of Jesus. She ain't getting away at this one. Next one. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, leave that up there because we'll come to that. She's terrified. She's touched a holy man. Doesn't this kind of uncleanness pass over to somebody else? That's why she had to keep away. What if she was about to get in trouble for all of this? And she'd come forward and been honest so many times before, and it had always ended badly. She's trembling. She's desperate to run. This will ruin my invisibility. This will invite trouble. This will change my life forever. I'll be trending on Twitter and not in a good way. This is going to be bad. But Jesus is relentless here. And he wants to give her more. And so she comes. <sighs> Came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Do you know the point you get to when your past and your history can't touch you anymore? Is when you're safe enough to tell the story in the presence of Jesus. And she's trembling and she's fearful. And even in the moment there will be cr uh, people in the crowd with eyes that are judging. But she's at Jesus' feet. And the only set of eyes, the only voice that matters the one that has to echo and have more power in her life than even the crowd around her is Jesus. And I absolutely love this because he looks at her. Let's have a look. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. It's what her, it's what her faith moved her to do, to go to the right place. And the right place isn't a place or a principle or a practice, a person. And his name is Jesus. And he looks at her. And if any of you have ever got any questions about how a holy God deals with a person who is carrying shame and wants to hide away, just look at this. He moves towards her to restore. He says, I call you out of your isolation. I break the curse on you. I call you out of your separation. I call you out of your debilitation. I call you, what does he call her? Daughter, Daughter of who? <coughs> Jesus. Some of you are desperate for a few more followers on Twitter. The declaration over this woman's life is that she is a daughter of the king. This is better than every Disney story where Cinderella gets turned into a princess. Am I in the right story? Yeah, that sounds about right. Don't you ever call her the woman with the issue. You call her the daughter of the king. Do you see what happens when you receive from Jesus? You don't just get what you think you need. You get your identity redefined. I'm hoping, I, I'll be to tell whether you believe this or not. Because tomorrow, no, forget tomorrow. Later on, when you walk into the dining hall, your posture will change. <laughs> Especially those of you who are so, don't want to be seen. You know, you walk with a slight, th th there's a reason why girls go like that. When you know you're the daughter of the king, I've got a game, baby. He loves me. He loves me. Could you imagine the level of boldness if we lived in the reality that Jesus speaks a new name over you and me? He claims us for his own and calls us his children. But talk about a downer right now. This would have been where the credits roll and the music comes in and everybody's happy and the disciples feel like schmucks. But there we go. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some, uh, someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher 
any further. I don't know what his face would have looked like, but he'd have been in shock. And right then, he'd been going, really? That's been going on for 12 years. Couldn't you have waited a bit, Jesus? You've got a serious problem with your triage system. Any nurse tells you that the more serious the issue, you go and deal with that one first, please. You know, you deal with the heart attack before you deal with the the cut thumb. And now she's dead. At the very least, one thing we should consider is that sometimes we're tempted to believe that other people can get in the way of us receiving something from who Jesus is. Sometimes we can get a little bit bitter about that. Or if they hadn't been there, maybe this would have... This dad's going to find out in an incredibly powerful and personal way that when Jesus wants to bring grace into your life, there is no circumstance, no timing that can get in the way of that. Oh, it might not go according to our script, but he won't be stopped when he wants to give mercy and show grace. And so we move into this really strange story. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Were you not listening, Jesus? It's over. She's dead. Let's keep going. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John and the brother of James. Keep going. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion. People weeping and wailing loudly. Uh, just kick back to that one just for a second. This is a, this, it makes me laugh about in speak. So when, um, when there's a funeral in speak, there's always some sort of big knees up afterwards uh, and sort of our way of celebrating and recognizing death is to hire a DJ um, I've, got, I've got concerns about that but back in, the, back in the day they used to hire professional wailers and mourners people who were there to their, their job was to express the grief of everybody else and so he, the Lord Jesus comes into this and it's just another reassurance of, of just how broken and sad and difficult the situation was And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. How do you think they responded to that? Well, in case you're not sure, it tells us. And they laughed at him. Have you noticed how we're always trying to bring Jesus into our paradigm because we don't understand who we're dealing with? And that laughter was the opposite of the actions of faith that we've seen so far. It is the actions of utter disbelief. There is no way that Jesus is big enough to deal with this one. But he put them outside and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Can I tell you that the way he goes about this is... It's <sighs> well, put it this way. When you go to pastor's school, they teach you a little bit. And one of the things that they're very clear about is when you go into a, a funeral situation, you never stand there and say, don't worry, folks, I'm here. But Jesus did. And they found it difficult to believe. And so he went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kum." which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And you see this tender moment. Her chest isn't even moving. She's very still. I don't know whether there was anger in Jairus' eyes. I don't know whether there was weeping in the mother's eyes. For once, Peter stays quiet. He knows. And the Lord Jesus just takes this little hand maybe already gone a little bit cold, grabs a hold of the hand and says, sweetheart, time to get up. I try that at about 7.30 most mornings. (laughs) How do you think that goes for me? (laughs) Who is this who says that when I am present... The curse of death has little more impact on you than having an afternoon nap. Who is this who claims total authority? Who says that when I'm near and when I call you, 
I can call you out of death. I can wake you up. Now we are utterly terrified of death and rightfully so because it, we've got no power before it. Sometimes we pretend. You can only do so many reps at the gym. It will only protect you for so long. But then we're powerless. But when Jesus is around, <laughs> it's as easy as wake, waking up a child from an afternoon sleep. The promise of scriptures is that all of his people one day will awake at the call of Jesus. All of them. Isn't that somebody you want to be around? And the tenderness here, let's keep going. And immediately, have we seen that before? The, the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. Let's just press on. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. You can imagine the scene. It's like, Dad, I know you've had a hard day, but just go give her to something to eat in case this all happens all over again. <laughs> now in the scriptures, there's only seven accounts of when people are, come back from the dead. And in six of those, six of them, those people live for a little while and then death takes them again. But in one of them, there is someone who raises from the dead and death never lays its hands on him again. Who is it? And he reigns the day in the power of an endless life and he holds the keys to death and hell. Is he somebody you want to be around? And at the center of this story is this issue of our neediness and how faith leads us towards him. And I realize that sitting in this room, some of you, you like the sound of this. It feels as if, wouldn't this be wonderful if it is true? But you really wonder whether you've got that neediness or you've got, have I got enough faith? Can I tell you this? Which is going to get you to the other side? A strong faith in a weak bridge or a weak faith in a strong bridge. Which one's most likely to get you to the other side? Who's the strong bridge? Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this one with such authority who claims and names the outcast and heals all diseases, who in an immediate moment can restore all that the curse has taken from us. We praise you for this one who speaks with a gentle word and life is restored in the midst of hopelessness. Please, Lord, would you help us to be the most needy people we know that we might run to the one who is the strong bridge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.